Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin. Uh, as the past couple of episodes, I've been focusing back on China. A lot much is happening in China, and that's something that we need to reckon with. To discuss the latest Chinese belligerence, aggressive actions, and talks, I have with me Lieutenant General Ravi Shankar, who's going to tell us what the connotation of these recent developments are. We're coming close to the 20th Party Congress, sir. A lot of things are moving forward. Yeah, uh, at the outset. Uh... Thanks for calling me over to your show, Adi. Once again, it's been a long time since we've had a discussion on China, and a lot of water has flown under the bridge. Yeah. All uh, right. And uh, you, be, you know, when we last spoke, we uh, uh, you know discussed how China's economy is in a mess, and uh, but they're still aggressive, and they continue to be so. And uh, they were on the horns of a dilemma whether to go towards Russia or to go neutral. Or stay out of the Ukrainian war, and what will their focus be? Then we had the Quad, uh, you know, and uh, most of the people shifting their focus on China, it was, uh, despite the commitment to U- Ukraine, especially USA, right? And the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum coming into play that seems to have had some effect on the Chinese outlook because they see it as a threat. To their hegemony in that area, mm-hmm. so a lot of cross currents, a lot of issues, a lot of outreaches, a lot of rebuffs, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I think uh, it's time for us to discuss China uh, a little more seriously, considering the fact there is an outreach to us, uh, and. Uh, China desperately wants India off its back, right? At the same time, India has its own compulsions uh, as to how to respond or not respond, and our trade imbalance has grown further for some reasons, right? So I think we need to understand the new emerging scenario a little better. Uh, you can start with your questions. So I want to start with the BRICS. You know, interesting thing. Uh, President Putin, when he was talking, he was talking more about the West and the sanctions and this and that. Evidently, he's going through it. So I guess that was on top of his mind. Uh, you know, the Brazilian president's address was not highlighted that much. It was more about development within that particular region. South Africa again spoke about African interests and food security and all that. Uh, Prime Minister Modi spoke about technology and development, and I think his spiel has remained the same in pretty much most of the forums with regards to technology, make in India, and stuff like that. But the Chinese president was completely different. He was seemed to be pretty aggressive. He actually put out threats. He put out ultimatums. Uh, he was quite aggressive with regards to the West and its tactics against China. Uh, how do you kind of see this aggression coming out of the president himself? Uh, the wolf warrior or the lion warrior in chief, if I may. <laughs> Let's put it this way: China is feeling a lot of internet, getting uh, you know pressurized from a lot of angles. Economically, it's under the pump. Mm. Uh, the zero COVID policy and the Omicron, you know, they're they're having their own effect. Uh, internal dynamics are changing in China. Externally, uh, there is a isolation. I mean, this isolation is not only external but internal also, right? So there is a lot of thing, and China is trying to reassert itself uh, in the international order. Okay, if it doesn't, uh, it could get swamped. Hmm. Right? And China is not that kind. After all, China is a huge economy. It's a strong nation. It will come out firing with all uh, on all cylinders. So that's why we saw Xi Jinping in the BRICS summit. Uh, he is now trying to give the impression that the uh, Taiwan is his red line. Don't mess with it. We'll do whatever it takes. So if the China, if the West wants to get involved, they have a fight on their hands. Uh, one of their ministers said it will be a last man, last round uh, fight mm. uh, kind of an issue. That they'll go all out to defend uh, their uh, claims and ideas in uh, Taiwan. 
So uh, the uh, Xi Jinping has used this as a platform, BRICS as a platform to warn. And the second, this thing, he has to revive his economy. So he has uh, floated this idea of a free trade agreement with between BRICS, so that the economies go. But it's a very clean, over overt ploy, uh, where uh, you know he's trying to. Ad, uh, make amends with everyone. Then he's also indirectly out, made an outreach to India. Right? That India outreach is significant because they've been trying it now for the past three to four months. Yeah, since the war began at least, yes, sir. War, war began. They know that there's going to be pressure on Taiwan. Unless they mend the borders or mend their fences with India, uh, they'll not be able to concentrate on Taiwan. Notwithstanding whatever they've done uh, since they, you know. Uh, so there, it's, there are three, four shades coming out. And then he has to talk tough for his own internal audience. And here is a tough president who's going to, you know, stare everyone down. Mm. Okay. And that is not letting go at all in the international thing. And it also gives a message to a lot of people to say, look, I'm trying to form an alternate alliance to the West. And there are reports which say, okay, this alternate alliance will be China-led with Russia, Iran, North Korea, Pakistan, you know, all these put together. So that's why, uh, you know, it is mere belligerence. I wouldn't say wolf warrior kind of a belligerence, but it was quite an aggressive speech at BRICS. Right? So, uh, and historically, whenever China has been threatened or it feels threatened or it is in a weak position, it uh, becomes aggressive. Right? So, there is, uh, this has to be understood in that context also. So there are a lot of angles to that speech. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of angles in that meet. Okay. So, and plus he had to uh, go out against the West so that there's a larger message that he's standing with Russia and he's not going to get caught down. And in China will follow, will not abide by the Western sanctions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are many, that, that talk had, too many channels. Maybe some of them I have not covered at all. One thing was he was silent on how we'll mend fences with Ukraine. It's not come about. And Ukraine was an important partner to uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, China. So there are a lot of issues uh, which are there and you know uh, which we have to factor in. I've highlighted some. There could be more. I'm sure, sir. And, uh, yeah. Uh, sir, you know, this red line thing that you mentioned seems to be a little interesting to me because uh, the Russians had also drawn a certain red line like this with regards to Ukraine and justified their, uh, I'm not getting to the rights and wrong of the Ukraine war, but politically speaking, Russians kind of made a base for their invasion tactics by creating that red, red line in 2008 during that uh, proverbial NATO summit where they said Ukraine, net, net, net. I mean, and mm. that's are the Chinese doing the same thing here? See, uh, uh, the, the Chinese have realized that uh, Taiwan is not going to be a cakewalk. Kindly. Right? Uh, they've realized it. And there are self-doubts in Taiwan as to how to, uh, not in Taiwan, in China as mm. to how to get across to Taiwan. The Taiwan is very clear that we've got a blueprint by which we can move ahead. Uh, as of today, any international commentator will tell you uh, that China is not yet ready, it's not prepared militarily to annex Taiwan. Politically, it is far away. Okay. Uh, the assessment is that in the next five years, uh, uh, China will be absolutely ready to do a cross strait action. Amphibious and all that. And Taiwan is very clear. They have started going the Ukraine way. They will not tell it, but uh, they have got already a blueprint. And they are not fools. <laughs> okay. So that is that. 
in the meanwhile uh they have made this claim that the taiwan strait the channel is ours okay some low level guy has said but that's the first slice of the salami slicing strategy they said look this is mine it was disputed earlier now it is mine now it will become legal you know that's the way they got hold of uh, the those islands and the south china sea also then the dan dash line came out and you know the, there's a ploy which is uh, unfolding then the red lines as per the chinese are that if taina if taiwan were to declare independence it's a red line they china is forced to do something mm. if another power comes to assist taiwan it's a red line for them right if at any point of time china feels threatened because of china uh, taiwan by any other power it's a red line for them it's complicated but these three issues are what they constitute this thing fundamentally what taiwan taiwan is mine i mean we have to understand that the communist china the communist party never set their foot on taiwan mm. taiwan was never part of the uh, chinese empire yeah. right uh, but still Uh, that's uh, that's what china's claim is and uh, for whatever reason people have accepted at some point of time people have accepted even the one china principle then of course i would say the west or rather the usa is already hinted of breaching one uh, uh, i won't say breaching that it is prepared to breach something red line or not they uh, almost dropped that one china principle because they it's gone off their websites and all that in right so that one china has been dropped the moment that one china is dropped there's a threat right so china has no choice but to react now there are talks of this militia action what is militia action they'll send a whole lot of boats fishing boats to fish in taiwanese waters see the international law says when there's a strait of this kind and two countries are there the line in between is the common point, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah the center point is you know but now they the chinese have been uh, you know violating the air defense zone as it is now they'll divide they will also violate the maritime line with my militia like they did in the south china sea and not only in the north the southern part of the south china sea recently so they'll flood so you don't know whether those boats are uh, civilian or not and they'll carry out all sorts of activities besides fishing and you can't touch them because it will become an international incident because they're civilian as part of that hybrid warfare gray zone warfare so they'll unleash that that uh, that uh, that i think will increase uh, this business of uh, the salami slicing will increase there's a plot there's a familiar plot unrolling hmm. right they making room right when everyone is busy with the handling this militia and this claims and all that they'll do some funny action and all this will they will try to politically append the system in uh, taiwan so that they create political chaos out there weaken the regime or the government out there prop up their own politics so that they can politically annex it or rather if they do a military action the politics of that place is weakened okay so it's a it's a long plan um but the important thing to he- understand here is they opened a new chapter till now we didn't hear of all this there's a new chapter opening up in how to go about annexing taiwan mm. we need to be cognizant of that okay they uh, one of like they made this boundary law against us and their boundary villages and all that you can't make a boundary law in sea but they'll they'll come up with some legal thing they'll declare some legality and so this is legally mine or something like that they'll come as it is the nine dash line they've claimed yeah uh right 
they've also disregarded the international court ruling when they lost that uh, yes, uh, claim to philippines mm-hmm. and that blowback has happened now where uh, you know philippines thought they'll discuss this and sort it out with china and that they wanted to get to a deal and finally last week i saw an article which said that's a deal no deal. Off. Mm. no deal with a new government coming in philippines so uh, they're going to get more aggressive the more than aggression it's a new chapter opening so you're going to have a whole lot of actions which we have not seen before it's probably the first page of the playbook of their yeah. or whatever and yeah and uh, now that the third aircraft carrier has been launched though it takes another 5 to 10 years before it becomes really operational uh, it's a psychological thing for taiwan that look china has three aircraft carriers it can do it can keep off so there are whole lot of things but one thing for sure taiwan is uh, china is very clear that there's a new start and they're going to do a new thing so right aircraft carrier is quite controversial itself so you're saying 5 to 10 years there are there are people who are saying the second one is not yet operational where will they get the third one yeah yeah, yeah there's no so look they built yeah first this part they built give it to them the, yeah give it to them that they built it okay it might take it's a part of their long term strategy absolutely absolutely so right now the the second aircraft carrier is not operational is known it will take look it takes 5 to 10 years for an op, uh, thing and they don't have aircraft for it is also known even for the first aircraft carrier they don't have aircraft yeah, they don't portable yeah. aircraft and they don't have if you see think about an aircraft carrier is if you a aircraft carrier needs a base to operate on okay and the aircraft carrier is used to project your power far and wide mm. without bases china can't project their its power far and wide with these aircraft carriers okay unlike usa which has got bases all over the world okay and they can send a aircraft carrier base it off somewhere else and project power that china can't do even in djibouti it can't take a aircraft carrier yeah, it can't mm. but it is preparing for a time when you know by the time these are operational it's hoping that it will get a base or a few bases where it can you know uh, operate from mm, mm, mm. so strategically you know you you've spoken about these militia boats and i'd go a little step forward we we know that these fishing boats and militia boats are being armed uh tactically they do make a lot of difference how about strategically when you look at this entire situation do you it's pure gray zone warfare mm-hmm. it's part of the gray zone warfare they'll come in a thing they then you can't react they armed also but uh, you can't use force against them uh, any action which they do will not provoke a war but the intent is to provoke you into some indiscriminate action right so mm-hmm. these are the issues mm-hmm. interesting right. so yeah so uh, you know one thing that we see in the brics is that the chinese tried quite a lot to kind of ensure that the russians spoke the same language it didn't really come out that way even during the conversation both the readouts were kind of different but we know that at the baseline both the countries kind of agree with their core interest in terms of russia's core interest in ukraine and china's core interest in taiwan and that has been expressed by both the countries i think that let's let's put that into perspective the relationship seems to be building but with certain lines and that is evident so one how do you assess the relationship and two how do you assess these lines that are pre existing see the uh... the relationship earlier which you know in the year before the olympics of no holds barred relationship without any limits that is gone that's only rhetoric which is left after this the russians are very clear that they worried about ukraine a wo all that and they find china a lifeline and they will like to splash all over the world that the chinese are with us 
the mm. indians are with us the world is with us very few people are with usa that's their line the chinese are playing a different game altogether they would like china behind them because energy technology which they don't have okay their aircraft technology will come from russia mostly it has been coming historically for yeah. future also it has to come from there okay otherwise china is not that good in their uh, you know aircraft technology so they need russia at the same time they don't want to get close to russia because russia is not a buying power it doesn't have that kind of buying power the buying power is in the west the buying power is in usa the buying power is, is in uh, uh, countries developing economies so geopolitically it will to some extent align with russia but only to that limit it will look to its interests that's why no one has said that look we are with russia in its deal with ukraine or rather in its war with ukraine not deal in its war with ukraine so okay and also you have to understand it needs russia in the northeast of china this vladivostok the russian base there vladivostok is the biggest one of the biggest bases yeah. in the eastern fleet uh, and china act together can hem in uh, japan south korea and draw resources of guam okay so that tree of japan that area right so it needs uh russia for that posturing there we don't understand it but because we geographically we are not there hmm. okay if you look at it and then there is this business of nuclear uh, i won't call it a flash point but a hot point coming up there that look at, we think of uh, the nuclear triangle of pakistan china and india here look at it there russia south korea north korea japan china plus a uh, extra regional presence of usa so six powers are there two aspiring to become nuclear powers in some form four nuclear powers and a uh, heavy maritime presence of each country there so there is a issue there so it needs russia in that area so it will you know geo strategically it will never veer away from russia it has to mend its fences and keep russia happy because that's the longest border india china is not the longest border it is the longest border is russia china some 4000 kilometers right sir? yeah if things go bad there okay the chinese are in great trouble and it hmm. historically the invasions of china have come from the northern plains and through mongolia all that or oh, they'll keep the russians uh, happy they don't want to pick up troubles with russians okay so there are geo strategic imperatives for china to keep russia on its side it is only when russia is on its side that china can go out into the maritime domain and expand otherwise forget it if you read it is not very far back i read a article just about last year by a chinese mm-hmm. who described the major threat of china is not from the sea but from uh, the northern plains trans siberia okay you know they have a problem and they'll keep russia on its side so but at the same time they don't want to be seen as aligned with russia completely in the ukrainian mm-hmm. war okay so they're playing a bit of a game out there and uh, xi jinping has used the brics forum to highlight all that 
And of course, they have to shore up their economy. Let's face facts. Chinese economy is facing problems. Yeah. See, it's like this. The US economy is also facing problems. Indian economy is also facing problems. Every economy is facing problems. But when it comes to the Chinese economy facing problems, the connotations are different. The connotation is different because China has all the while been bragging that we are the only fastest growing economy. We are a resilient economy. We, a communist system of government is the one of the best, etc., etc., etc. And that's not happening. Okay, that's not happening. Uh, and that has internal repercussions. Mm. That has internal repercussions. There are no jobs. Uh, real estate is in a mess. It's in a real mess. Uh, uh, home sales are touching new lows. I mean, if you uh, just today I read an uh, article about how bad the real estate sector is. We all thought Evergrande is only one. Almost 80 to 90 percent of the real estate developers in China are stuck with bad loans, bad... Uh, the, the local governments, the state and the provincial governments, used to make money out of sale of land. That was their major source of income, real estate. That's gone. So their local governments are in a problem. And you have to realize 30% of Chinese GDP is real estate. That's it. Big tech is hit. It's still, you see all these things which were headlines for three, four, five months back before the Ukrainian war. We used to discuss it. They're not gone away. Common prosperity has gone nowhere. And Uparsha COVID and today the discussion within China is, is Beijing worth it or uh, Shanghai worth it? Yeah. And what is the effect on the economy? Okay. And there are still cities and towns which are under lockdown. Okay. Their zero COVID policy is taking a toll on them. I mean, believe you me. So there is a, there are major issues which it has to this thing. So, and in this, it has to show that it is a leader still and it counts in global affairs. Right. So, it is, it will try. And let's also not forget, it's a big economy. Yeah. It's a huge manufacturing economy. It's got a huge military. It's only thing is, uh, its capabilities at this point of time, geostrategically, right, uh, are well short of its ambition. Uh, and China is not attractive. I think that the, is the big thing, yes. Yeah, and another issue which came out in this uh, BRICS meet is that uh, Russia floated the idea that we should have an alternate system of finance. They're looking at the, uh, China, the yuan to become a reserve currency. But the Chinese don't have the strength to do that. Yeah. China, China doesn't, you know, no one trusts China financially. The world doesn't trust China. There's no uh, transparency. Why is why do people trust dollar? I mean, you might hate it, but people trust it because there is a semblance of transparency. Stability and transparency, yes. Yeah, okay. But it, that's not so with uh, China. Why go that far? I'll give you a, a real-life example. Cambodia. Cambodia is a... Uh, a bosom alley of China. Okay. But if you go to Cambodia, the currency is not whatever Cambodian, uh, you know, their uh, currency is. It is dollars. If you go to a restaurant in Cambodia, the uh, menu is in dollars. Ah. You go and make an international call, it is in dollars. You pay in dollars. Everything is in dollars. And they have refused to get go on to UN or the RNMB. So if in these conditions, I don't think UN will become a reserve currency as people, some people are professing. Trust. Any transaction, any financial transaction is based on trust. Absolutely. 
So the trust with China is not there. And especially after what has happened in Sri Lanka, where it is being seen as the Chinese have let down Sri Lanka. If not let down, they have not come to their aid. It's bad PR, yes. Sir. Yeah. So that model, it was earlier Hamban Tota, Hamban Tota plus something. The Chinese, the Sri Lanka model is something which uh, the, uh, is going to indent the image of uh, China even more. So the, the all these fancy ideas that, that will be the global leader, what it, you know, Chinese rules, all that is will very far away still. Interesting. And as a matter of fact, you know, I must... Uh... Uh, thank you for putting me into that habit of reading the SEMP. Day before yesterday, I was reading wherein it, uh, the opinion piece where it, it talks about today China feels itself to be isolated. Uh, yeah. And that, I, I, I forget the author, he writes pretty often, he's a Hong Kong based guy. Uh, but one thing is interesting that if they are talking about isolationism, uh, which basically means that the realization of what you're saying that it stands alone in terms of not even being able to sell its products the way it would like to sell it pro its products. Uh, a lot of people are buying them, yes, but there is a movement in terms of decoupling which is taking place. So that that's an interesting uh, perspective because uh, intrinsically, and there's something that you've mentioned in one of our shows before, China Watch sort of a thing where you said that the internal consumption of the Chinese is not as high to kind of hold the Chinese economy itself. Yeah, they don't, they're not earning enough. Yeah. Jobs are at premium. They're not spending, you know, in the Chinese way of thinking, uh, owning a house is a great investment. It gives security. If you want to start a family, you need a house first. That's not going. Uh, un and a chi the Chinese, unlike the American or the Western, this thing doesn't spend on, you know, fancy luxurious items. Unless he's secure. And their idea of security is a home. The real estate sector is in a bad shape. So how will it go forward? It's dicey. China is still a um, export-based economy. Depend with today their caveats. People want uh, to hedge away from China. They want to build alternate uh, supply chains. So there are issues with China at this point of time. Indeed, sir. Sir, there was a recent news wherein the Chinese have again opened their coffers and given about $2.35 billion to the Pakistanis. Uh, somehow the Chinese still seem to believe that Pakistan is a good investment for them. Um, my question to you is about an, a report that came out, and this was publicized more in the Middle East and the Al Arabia and all these uh, channels kind of picked it up. The, a lot of writing was done in the Middle East about this, that the Pakistanis would try and kind of compensate the Chinese by giving them certain areas of Gilgit Baltistan uh, in, as compensation. Now, as ridiculous as that sounds, it, it uh, Pakistanis cannot be trusted to kind of think logically. This whole thing brings India further deep into this entire you know game. How do you analyze firstly the thought of it and to the connotations if this does take place? See, this whole story started, I think, with some uh, uh, someone from Gilgit Baltistan, one of the groups yeah. in Gilgit Baltistan. It's not come out officially. They might, it, there might be some truth in it because there's no smoke without fire, <laughs> right? So, but I don't think Pakistan will attempt this because this is a red line, okay. The moment they do that, then they're freeing us to do whatever we want to do. Yeah. Okay. Then the Chinese are extending themselves. This is exactly what America wants. Extend, extend China out and draw China out of their periphery. It's unless China extends itself, it can't be hurt. You could hurt, can you hurt USA? You can't. Because at home, 
when they are trying to mend fences with india they'll do this the moment they do this it will only go the other way around <laughs> so these are canards which will come up we have to be aware of it we have to react accordingly and convey to uh, chinese come welcome to gilgit baltistan then we'll do what we have to do the next thing is i hope it's true the day see first and foremost that's disputed territory we can't go and give disputed territory to yeah. another country already they did that wakan corridor which is under dispute the moment they open this that that dispute and this dispute will get conflated and then you can do what you want and then then, then you exploit this whole thing politically you start a political movement against this in baluchistan or uh, sorry i keep saying baluchistan gilgit baltistan so it is right if that happens and you again that movement in some form is conflated with uh, uh, pok right you can stir trouble i actually it will play into our hands if we use our brains yeah that's a sitting duck okay this is this is an opportunity we should use to uh, unfortunately i don't see a reaction from our, our side i don't see all that we need to use such you know canards to fly your own missile so which we are not doing right we need to indeed that 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 area i think we've discussed before is going to be the i mean any any Look, in that area is the center of gravity that area between afghanistan uh, zinjiang uh, pakistan india or china tibet you know uh, gilgit baltistan is the center of gravity yeah anyone who controls that area gains an advantage today pakistan is controlling the area it has got an advantage pakistan and china uh, in tandem control that area they have got the advantage you control that area you get an advantage straight into afghanistan and you have you you open the underbelly of china and uh, zinjiang and tibet so it's this i always maintain for us in the indo Uh, sino india pak uh, triangle gilgit baltistan is a center of gravity if chinese are attempting to come there we should exploit it as simple as that water yeah water okay. security of pakistan totally dependent on gilgit baltistan indus okay and they building the dam there i'm forgetting its name suppose that's the lifeline at this point of time dasu and the other one uh, well, dasu is uh, other side other side and this uh, is supposed to be partner dams or some some spiel i'll there. i'll i'll, I'll it, it just slips my mind i'll get back to yeah, yeah. right uh so interestingly it is now a known fact that chinese economy is kind of you know rocky when we were talking about it a year 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 and a half ago a lot of people didn't believe us because it was probably a little bit of a premature analysis on our part when we put out that information that this is what we foresee later on but more or less i would say things are falling into what we had said that you know there's going to be covid troubles there's going to be economic troubles there's going to be isolationism there's that whole things i think the chinese have added a cream on the cake when they've done these harsh lockdowns so there's a lot of unnerven you know sort of a uh, nervousness within the population with regards to the leadership 
now if we look back into chinese history and i think you've alluded to that in one of your answers today as well is that the chinese are prone to kind of you know please their internal audience more by acting yeah. outward if i may uh yeah how do you yeah, see good. this game see the Ch- the chinese communists have a social contract with their people we'll give you your uh, security and you give us uh, your freedoms okay uh, this lockdowns this all this has put that under threat the common prosperity uh, the lockdown the you know uh, coming down on the tech sector coming down on the yeah uh, reality sector was all due to this growing inequity between the wealthy and the poor now that is backfiring the zero covid policy combined with all that is now creating problems within china people are questioning why why we gave you everything we are not giving us what we wanted hmm that social contract is under threat is that social contract is under threat the chinese system is under threat and that is something they are reacting to now that reaction internally is one angle externally they have to prove themselves and as toughest so that internally people know oh, our government is one of the toughest in the world we know how to handle all problems also that gives the the uh, chinese government a chance to tell the people that look there are people who want to try to break us the external threat will build up the external threat so there are a lot of whatever china does externally is largely directed at the internal audience also mm. nationalism building up and all that part of the deal you know the victory over covid all part of that deal but if you say is there a will the chinese system collapse no it will not collapse because xi jinping might go that's a different story but i i mean even that i'm doubtful mm. does the chinese communists have a too deeply entrenched in this whole story there no alternate uh, to them at this point of time politically and in in china anything you do about china the first thing you see is what are the political issues in that uh, angle in that in this the, the, the chinese communists are uncontented there is no contender for them okay in fact the way i look at it the contender is sitting in taiwan <laughs> yeah i'm not joking if tomorrow china were to lose a war against taiwan or get stuck in a ukraine kind of a situation the political bridge will take place and there will be an alternate political system for chinese to choose and that's where china the chinese communists will be under threat and that is why they will not uh, blunder into taiwan in a hurry okay and today if they do that the politically they are not ready to go anywhere huh? politically they have to concentrate internally and stabilize their own situation also remember we are not i have not spoken about so far there it's an aging society the fastest aging society in the history of mankind so it's got there are a lot of connotations which we have discussed we have forgotten so i'm re- reminding okay elon musk yeah. said something really interesting sir he said chinese will lose 40% per generation uh see he it that might be a little extreme but he's not far off the mark i mean pinch of salt or a probably a fistful yeah, of yeah. salt even but that's a huge amount to lose per generation see, 30 years there, there there's a issue to this mind you if their uh, population contracts is their population contracts it's good for the chinese okay the land will support them their food insecurity problems will get resolved their energy requirements will go down a lot of things will go down their population contracts but the way the population contract the the way the population is contracting mm. they are losing productivity they are losing uh, workforce participation in the economy and their population is uh, aging 
so the uh, this contraction which is happening is being thrust on them and the population control which they ex- which uh, they exercise with the last generation helped them right so it it's something which one has to un- read in greater detail to understand this phenomenon well, absolutely i mean their 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 newspaper the china daily talks about automation being able to kind of uh, they don't have that kind of automation the japanese so, are doing they, it since the 1970s sir see the ja- japanese are an advanced society these yeah. people are not one of the reasons why they're continuing with the zero covid policy this harsh zero covid policy is they don't have a health system Ah uh-huh. their system it it is said if the uh, if covid spreads far and wide within china their status will be worse than what we went through in the second wave in india sorry to be disagreeing with you but i think they've already gone through worse than what we went through well we don't know i mean, uh, I mean okay it, it'll it, be shown no, worse than yeah worse than it yeah, it'll come out yeah mm-hmm. that's the point yeah so interestingly but you know uh chinese one thing that we we need to see and we need to look out for is the fact that they always have a card that they pull out at the last moment and that's something that fast sometime we've seen uh, they've been able to kind of create a situation wherein they the world kind of runs behind and tries to react we saw it in the pacific we saw it with the indian uh, india loc situation although the world didn't kind of you know react that's pretty evident and to be left aside uh the way that the whole uh russia china alliance that was taken forward they just it was a last moment thing people didn't think about this whole no limits thing and stuff like that having said this whole thing one also realizes that the options for these 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 hidden cards are now pretty much yeah, I, i think you hit the this thing the uh, china is now hemmed in yeah geo strategically it's hemmed in geo economically it's hemmed in okay i think the days when it it could you know lay down the rules Me, are over i think yeah you you've said it right better than what i wanted okay. to say mm. it will it will it will continue to be a big economy there's no doubt it continue to be a huge uh, manufacturing uh, economy there's no doubt it will continue mm. to be a big power no doubt but will it be able to lay the rules of the road no let's take the last meet at devos the chinese were hardly present there yeah economic forum okay. sir the economic forum they were hardly present there so there are uh, right now that's why i said there are many people who say china has peaked right and there is also another issue which has come to the fore they say when you define what is a superpower a superpower is a power where which you cannot be ignored when you want to solve international problems okay without which you can't solve an international problem if you go through there are many definitions of a superpower but one of this is this that a superpower is one where which you need to solve an international problem or which solves the international problems or without which you cannot solve an international problem if you take the russia ukraine war china has been ignored in that ignored it is neither part of the sol- it is not part of the solution it is part of the problem problem mm. and no one is hearing what it says no one has even consulted it so the limits of the chinese geostrategic strength uh, have come out and that's one of the reasons why china has become belligerent of late or assertive of late they want to regain that and they're not finding uh, the pacific islands and uh, those complete uh, lot they said they've rebuffed china yeah philippines has said thank you sri lanka has got a problem the pakistanis are worried one part of pakistan says no no we have to go to china other there is another part of china pakistan which said no let's not burn our boats yeah that's that's pretty latest they are the kind of yeah. a little yeah. worried about this whole thing absolutely 
so no so that all those limitations are coming to the fore you know what i wanted to say was you said that the superpower is one that is called to resolve problems what do you call a power that creates problems so that's <laughs> Right. So that's, that's a, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Flip side of the story, but anyway, so no, no China discussion is complete by not discussing the India-China angle to it. The, we are, uh, I won't say we are stuck. I would say that the situation seems stuck. Uh, talks are supposed to be happening. Wang Yi came here, tried to kind of persuade India for a in-person meet in, in for the BRICS. Didn't happen. It became virtual. Uh, you know things don't seem to be kind of if it's not going our way it's not going china's way either so let me let me let me put it like that how do you look uh, at it let's uh, see as much as we've discussed about china the flip is that in india uh, we have uh, the indian role in global affairs has gone up on that there's no doubt so your geostrategic heft has gone up china's has probably gone down so you are on a better footing to talk with them and that's what everyone has been doing especially if you see the our external affairs minister the, his statements indicate that very clearly and we have very clearly said unless we address the boundary problem nothing else will go forward mm. right so that is a given now china realizes that it cannot move forward without india that's why that outreach they want india on their side russia is see russia while it has come to you it has not one day said move away from indo pacific it's not able to whereas china is that's their line their only way of getting india off the indo pacific deal and part, not being part of cod is to mend fences with the help of russia that's what they're trying they tried it in brics they tried it earlier as well. before as well yes brics they did it overtly okay so they will and with india they'll need even more on their side with sri lanka going bad with maldives not progressing myanmar is a basket case yes, uh, it's a it's a no man's land so if they don't have a presence in the indian ocean uh, chinese ambitions are far away they've gone farther all this can be offset only if india is on its side but india is against so it's a interesting thing you have some cards uh, but for all the atmanirbhata we have spoken our trade imbalance with china has gone yeah right southwards so something uh, which we have not played our cards well also yeah yeah absolutely there are, there is a gap somewhere i mean this this there is a gap somewhere yeah. between what we want to do and what we, is happening and all that is probably okay. beyond the scope of this discussion in terms of the industry requirements and this and that but hey, that something the fact is that there is some uh, this thing. the government is trying to become the alternate to china in many manner which is okay but they the dependence on china has whereas they don't they are very clear they don't import rice from you they import rice from everywhere you are one of the biggest producers and exporters of rice yeah. but they don't take it from india they are also one of the biggest importers of rice in the world they go elsewhere but they don't take it from you that's why they have laos and cambodia they mm-hmm. get maximum of the rice there you know from the mekong delta yeah yeah okay so we are not able to uh, leverage they we give them uh, you know uh, raw material and they give you back value added goods something like the british imperial system we i don't know how we got got caught in that you have a great drug uh, uh, industry okay but you still get the api from china and your drugs are not given back to china they are given somewhere else they are not dependent on you for drugs yeah so they have played this game smarter i mean let's be very clear they have played this game far smarter than us 
so you have levers which you are not used well uh, okay so i think we need to also sit and do some in house thinking mm. as to where how do we handle this <clears throat> whole story they are in a position to choke your economy today yeah absolutely not mm. us right they might not because if they do that they're going to be hitting themselves yeah mm. i mean okay so uh, so there's something which we'll have to see i hope the government plays a smart hand in this i was reading a article about the this this entire thing in the economic times and the argument given that how can india do it when the world is not do it i don't buy that i mean of course we need to look out for our own interest rather than yeah yeah yes. kind of you know figuring out what the world is doing because yes which is true that the world has not been able to decouple with china the way they had planned to do it and yeah, yeah i agree with you and they can't also let's be very frank yeah. you can't you can't do in a hurry i've always maintained if you do 20 20 to 25% decoupling it's more than enough sir thank you so much uh, this has been uh, interesting i think uh, after a long time we've kind of covered up the entirety of china of course this has been a long episode we'll try and do shorter ones the next time so that it's easier for people to watch uh, we are planning one on pakistan that will come up and uh, of course there's there's some more stuff that we would want to do about china which we will come up with and there's a lot which is going to happen in the indo pacific in the coming some time and those are the feelers till then sir jai hind jai hind and thank you